So let's uh, continue on. We're going to have our next presentation from Felipe Cruz from CSCS, who's going to be talking about cloud native HPC clusters. Hello, everyone. My name is Felipe Cruz. I'm technical lead engineer at CSCS. I've been working for, um, well, I work in different technologies. Uh, I've been doing HPC containers for maybe five to six years. I've had been doing uh, RESTful APIs for HPC for maybe four. And uh, in the last two years, I've been doing the work that actually leads me to what I'm going to present today and that be cloud native HPC clusters. So from the title, you know, this could be anything, right? Uh, it's uh, maybe it'd be a good title for maybe some uh, Twitter entry or something like that. Uh, doesn't say a lot. But I think before I jump into the details, I need to provide some context. So why are we doing some of these works? As you might know, uh, we're getting a new system that is going to be the successor of our flagship uh, supercomputer at CSCS. Um, I'm not going to provide a lot of details because tomorrow Maxim Martinez is going to talk in the afternoon and give an update on how that work is going and a lot of things of what that entails. But in a nutshell, so if I tell you in a nutshell what's happening there. So we're building this on top of the HPE Cray um, Chasta stack. What this basically boils down to is that now we're going to have the capability to do software-defined infrastructure on via APIs. Now, how this changes things, now well, we're still managing infrastructure, but we're doing, doing it differently. And the idea here is that we're going to have a single versatile infrastructure. So our big supercomputer um, is going to be very flexible. Now, the idea would be that as we tackle more problems, instead of having, as we were used to, instead of having um, one solution per one problem, the idea is to have one system that fulfills all these different needs. And the way that we ad adapt that solution, then will be at these software-defined components. Um, so as I said, it's going to be flexible. We're going to have software-defined solutions and not longer via, via hardware. So we can move much faster then. So let's imagine then that the capabilities there in terms of the, the infrastructure itself to do this. It, it still, things need to be instantiated on top of the infrastructure. And the question would be, how do we instantiate these vers vers versatile clusters for our customers? And uh, hopefully I will try to give you a hint of what we're working on, because there is a lot of details. Um, can be a little bit uh, tricky to follow. Right, so let's start with some definitions. When I mentioned cloud native at the beginning, what do I mean? So maybe the best one I've seen so far is the definition from the Cloud Native Compute, Computing Foundation. And I'm going to read very quickly, but some highlight some, some parts that I find the most relevant for, for us. So we have cloud native technologies and power organizations to build and run scalable applications in modern dynamic environments, such as public, private, or cloud. And then uh, it leverages and containers, service meshes, microservices, immutable infrastructure, and declarative APIs to a simplified approach. The techniques, these techniques then enable loosely coupled systems that are resilient, manageable, and observable. This is what we want to get out of this. And then combined with automation, this will allow us, the engineers to do high impact changes frequently and predictable with minimal thought. So basically, we want to have this type of capabilities and bring them to HPC. But how do you do that? Well, it happens that um, cloud native leverages four pillars. Um, you could say, well, some people write more, but uh, I, I think that the ones that I like are four. So you use containers, you try to build everything using a microservice architecture. You put that for um, the developer side, via, with, you support that with CI CD pipelines. And then for the, for the automation part, you do DevOps. So these are your, your four pillars. So then I thought, well, how do you, well, that's not enough for, you need to do some more things in order to, to bring it up to HPC, so we need to adapt it. 
Um, so we, we somehow need to have some type of cloud nat native HPC cluster, at least from the software, software side point of view. So I went and asked DALI2 to, to, to make a pictorial representation of what would be a native, cloud native supercomputer. This is what it came up with. So pretty nifty. Um, so put into context, what does this mean? Right. So do you remember I mentioned that the, the software stack layer that we're going to be leveraging out of for, for the infrastructure will be the HPE um, Chasta? So we're going to be, do, to be doing dynamic provisioning on top of, of Chasta. The idea then is that the services that are going to be composing or, or clusters are going to be uh, based on a microservice architecture. So that means that all of them are loosely coupled between each other and independently deployable. And we're going to leverage um, cloud native techniques. So the, the four pillars that I mentioned before in order to, to deliver these services. And, uh, and as the definition said, what we want to get out of this is to, to make these services more um, resilient, manageable, and observable. And this is kind of features that you normally see from, from uh, cloudish applications. Now, and this is what we would like to see, and what we get out of this is because we now have a decoupled architecture for our cluster delivery. It means that we could have multiple teams of engineers working on different components. This is what we get out of this loosely coupled microservice architecture. Also, if you think that we're using containers for doing the delivery of some of these things, then that means that we can easily produce lots of changes on top of the artifacts that, that produce that the uh, the, the artifacts that, are, that, that support that services, and hopefully we minimize toll if we do it properly via CI/CD. Right. Um, but so far, I was just talking about very vague things. I mean, a, a lot of nice words, but in practice, what does this actually mean? Um, and I think that the best way to explain it is to go bottom up. So I start from the lowest levels of the stack and try to build up the whole picture going up and there'd be a lot of gaps. So you will have to excuse me for that. It's just that there is too much detail to go through. Um, but hopefully you get an idea of more or less how things work. So at the lowest level, we have the, the, the Chasta interfaces. And these allow us to dynamically provision the infrastructure. And here's what picturally what you see here on, the, on your left. Right. So on your left would be basically all of the resources that we have. These are compute nodes. From our infrastructure, we provision those via the, the Chasta APIs, and we can set up some, some basic configurations. So we can define them by software in any, any way that we might want. Um, so we're instantiating these nodes. Now, the, the way that we're using them on, on this cloud native um, approach is that we're going to set them up for all of them to be identical so that they can be interchangeable. And on this, this, in this system, basically we're going to have a base system with a minimal OS, just the basic devices that you need to have available to, in order to use the infrastructure, um, maybe give access to core file systems, the VLANs, and other core services that you need, that you will need later, I will show you what you need, but basically it boils down to an orchestrator that is going to ma be managing the services and an HPC container engine. So now we have a fleet of nodes. All of them are this very nice initial state and they're very minimal. We did this via the, the crazy CSM, so the Chasta management layer. Right, so now that we have this you know, nicely uniform set of infrastructure. So we have our fleet. We want to start bringing up services and use these resources in some way in order to provide this, the, the traditional HPC experience. So maybe we're going to carve, we want to carve some of the, of the nodes. So maybe we will have a pool and of, of resources and some of these nodes are going to be running maybe Slurm. Maybe some of the, of some other nodes from the same, uh, tenant, the same groups of resources are going to be running cluster services like GitLab runners, maybe some HPC APIs like Firecrest that we develop at CSCS, maybe Jupyter Hub, and the, the list can be very long about the kind type of services that you can provide there. Maybe we have another part, another uh, set of nodes 
that is going to be provided uh, high throughput computing kind type of capability. So we're able to to mix um, these uh, these type of uh, resources and manage them. Now, if you notice, I I, I so the, the nodes change from being um, single line to a dash line, and the difference would be that the base nodes are static. Let's say I set them up initially and they don't change, but this, when I started to bring up these services on top of my nodes, now I'm, I'm doing this dynamically. So while the node is live, I'm starting these services and configuring, configuring the cluster live in this way. Um, and then, well, I also need my orchestrator, which is the one that is going to decide how to actually use the resources in order to instantiate my services. Um, it, 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 so the orchestrator needs to be running somewhere, that would be this normal support pool that it's going to be providing basically the decision on what to run where. Now, okay, so you kind of imagine more or less how it could work, and I was talking about this orchestrator. Now you still need to somehow interact with the infrastructure in order to do this. And as I was mentioning, you have um, two level, two, two type of interfaces. I was mentioning the Chasta interfaces, which would be the, the CSM part that you see at the bottom. Yeah, you can see my mouse. Good. Um, and you have the infrastructure team that will deal with that, and then you have my orchestrator, which is based on HashiCorp Nomad, that is going to be instantiating my services. So at a glance, this is what it looks like. So here just, I gray out all of the service part, and I show you how to set up my, my nodes in this base state. And I do it via the, the Gray System Management, the CSM. So this is how I bring up, and then I have an infrastructure team that is going to be the one responsible for orchestrating and managing my fleet. And, and as soon as these nodes come up alive at the infrastructure level, then um, the infrastructure team can add them directly to the orchestrator, so that will be Nomad. So now Nomad is aware that the resources are available for it to use. And then I gray out now the infrastructure team, and I show you that I have a different set of administrators that not, might not necessarily be your normal system administrator, might be engineers without root privilege, maybe, um, that are able then to instantiate HPC services that are already in microservice form and via the orchestrator. So they're not talking directly, they're not running Ansible scripts on your nodes. They are actually talking directly to the orchestrator and they are, they are specifying what type of services they want to run. And then the orchestrator is the one that is responsible for actually instantiating them, like finding the resources where to run, instantiating the services, deploying them, maybe deploy up updates and also do some of the self-healing. Right, so let's, let's move to the next level of, uh, so I'm still crawling up from the bottom to the top. So on the next level, I just zoom in on what's going on at the orchestrator side. And, and more or less, this is the full picture. What you see at the bottom are a collection of notes. I could not put all of the notes that I had on the previous slide because that would be too much and I wanted to show you what's happening a little bit on the internals, but you get more or less the idea that we could do this for any type of nodes. Now, I color them to kind of show you the, the type of pools that you might have, but this you also define by software. This is not um, defined by hardware, and then the deployment itself is managed by the, by the, by the Noma server that you see here. So what actually is going on here? So we have this orchestrator tool. Uh, this is normal from HashiCorp. It's a very simple and flexible orchestrator, so it, it basically scheduled work. But the, the key part of it is that it's flexible. So it, you're not only constrained to use containers as you have with, um, with Kubernetes. It allows you to also schedule any other type of application, which could be from uh, lightweight virtual machines, so virtual machines to um, binary applications, so basically uh, raw binaries that you might have available on your system. And you also it also provides you a set of tools that are very similar to the ones that you get to Kubernetes, so you can specify artifacts that you might have in other places. Anyways, um, the, uh, the orchestrator then you have a set of interfaces that allow you to manage the service with some automated components so that you can do provisioning, deploy, configuration, lifecycle management, and self-healing. Kind of the same ideas you, that you get out of Kubernetes. Now, the architecture itself of this thing is that you have a server that is going to be basically scheduling work across your infrastructure and decide where things run, and then you have agents that are collocated on your, on your nodes. So these are the ones that are actually spinning up, spinning up the work. Um, 
basically you have agents running on your whole infrastructure and then the server is telling them what to do what to do there and then when you start in a service then what happens is oh wait no i need to give a one extra bit of information so what are you going to be spinning up then well you need to specify specify some kind of artifacts that you need you want to be, uh, bring up and this could be so basically what are your services so that might either be containers or binaries um, plus configuration files and maybe something else that believes in uh, some registry and you want them to bring this uh, artifacts into your nodes and instantiate them. That's basically what the orchestrator does. So you have your artifacts, you have your orchestrator, and then you need to instantiate the things that are going to happen inside the, the actual node. And this is done by the agent, agent and, and this guy is able to do the whole life cycle of that particular service that you're bringing up. Right, okay, so I, I see what you mean. I think that the, so if you want to split the way that the resources are used, you can do it at the, at the interfaces provided by the Nomad server itself. So this is architecture that is happening uh, internally within uh, Nomad. Now, at the highest level, you can create namespaces so that you can separate logically the resources at that level of the interface. So you don't need to do it at the, at the lowest level. You can create policies to associate resources and then multiple users or engineers could be running applications within their own sandbox, let's say, that is managed by the orchestrator. Now, it actually, what you can do and what you cannot do, it will uh, depend on the driver that you're executing inside the node, and it's, that's a long discussion, the explanation of how this actually works, but capabilities are there to do this separation that you're asking for. There are some trade-offs related to, at the bottom, what, which approach you're using in order to instantiate your services. But the answer is, you could do it, not at that level, you do it up. And in the same way that you manage namespaces with uh, Kubernetes, you can do the same here. Okay. So at the namespace level, let's say, we might hit some... Right, so now you're thinking, even, uh, yeah, you could do, definitely you can do that. Um, and, uh, more isolated, I guess, than the namespace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But maybe at that level you might be have you, you might have these separated instances of, of the orchestrator itself. Right. Okay, so I move on. There is I still have a bunch of things to to show you guys. Um, now, so we move to the next level. I, I explain how you instantiate the services, but what are these services? I mean, at the moment, still, there is a lot of, um, you know, not well-defined things. And um, now, on, on Nomad, you, you specify your services via these HTL, HTL file descriptors. So this is HashiCorp uh, configuration language. I believe that's what the acronym starts, uh, stands for. Basically, what you do inside is that you can specify what resources you're going to use, so how do you deploy them, how do you deploy the service, how, do, how this service is going to use, be using the resources that it has um, underlying, and then what type of artifacts are going to be consumed, so what are your binaries that you want to instantiate, what are your configuration files that you're going to bring up in order to be able to instantiate the service. Now, I'll say that the ideal way, the ideal way to, to deploy services is via containers. However, and, and I think this covers, out of ex our experience, covers a good range of use cases that they can be containerized. However, we do have some traditional HPC services that are really not container friendly. So things get very complicated and you end up with some anti-patterns where, well, and this could be due to conflicts with C groups or maybe with Linux namespaces. Maybe they're doing some crazy um, IPC inside within the different components of, of the tools. So they're very difficult to decouple. So to create them as microservices um, using the container abstraction is rather not impossible, but very, very hard. And you end up with anti-patterns that actually means that you put more work than the benefits that you get out of it. And this is out of my experience, so you will have to take it face value. I, I did not prepare a presentation on the challenges for some of the traditional HPC applications. Now, what Nomad brings in, then, is this flexibility. So in these cases that are traditional, they don't work very well, then we can, we can use uh, Nomad in order to instantiate uh, native binaries, basically. Now, we can still manage those as artifacts, so this is a, a cool thing that we could do. So we can bring them, we don't need to have them on the, on the nodes when we want to start them up, so we can manage the, 
the, the artifact life cycle, let's say, via this set of interfaces. We can bring these binaries, we can set up arguments, we can run them as root, and we can do all of this via these nice nomad interfaces, which have some IAM layers, so we get a lot of the benefits that you get out of the cloud. Now, in practice, now I show you something. Uh, this is my um, service descriptor for my Slurm daemon. Uh, and this doesn't look anything complicated. I'm just doing, trying to instantiate my, my daemon. And I, as I was mentioning before, I'm going to be using the raw exec driver that allows me to instantiate a native binary um, and telling exactly what's the binary that I want to run on, on the nodes. This assumes that the, nodes, uh, the, the binary is already available there and already did some under the hood work in order to, to get them there where it needed to be there. So some software delivery work, I will not go into details right now. I can pass some arguments, whatever arguments I want to set up. I could put configuration files if I wanted to. And I'm running as root because this needs to run with privilege. So you see now that I have these nice interfaces in order to do all of this. Uh, so you believe me, if I can do this for, for um, SLAMD, I can do it for, for pretty much everything. So now I should be able to manage pretty much any service that you might have on your cluster with this type of interfaces. Now, I hope that for most of them, I use containers rather than raw exec, but in these very complicated case, cases that you have these conflicts that I was talking about before, you could do it in this way. Now, let's imagine that I have my collection of microservices described with my HCL files that shows me how I need to do the deployment of the services and what kind of resources you need to use. And I also have artifacts that I generated in order to be a CI-CD pipelines in order to properly manage maybe Slurm. So I have maybe multiple versions of, of Slurm or my artifact registries, and I just need to pull them and how I pull them or what I pull and with what configurations I do, I do, I describe it via my ACL. So I can have my cluster administrators or my, my microservice engineers that are working on each of these tools independently and they are producing and managing the life cycle of the artifacts themselves via CI-CD pipelines. So this is a part of the flow where you get CI-CD pipelines. Um, then someone else could be the, the cluster manager or administrator that is setting up the actual configuration that is going to run for your service. And all of this is passed to the Noma server, server then that is doing the automatic deployment on top of your infrastructure. Uh, so this is an update on, on how the bootstrap actually works. So that gives you a general idea of how that works. Um, and now with that, Hopefully, I gave you a, like a, a vision of how this works, and I tell you one of the capabilities that I have as a bonus of using this uh, abstraction layer in order to work with this. Yes. Sorry, just a question before you. Um, right. So. Service, because that happens in another normal service. Wait, wait. So okay, maybe I I, I skip some points. The, this is for the administration of the system. Now, from the point of view of the end users, so the normal user that is taking advantage of our infrastructure, nothing change. We're going to have login nodes, and they're going to have access to queues, and everything is business as usual for them. Now, this internal software that is allowing them to provide that, so setting up the login nodes, bringing, configuring the Slurm so that it has the capabilities that the user expect, this we're managing in a cloud native way. So what this means, and this is, what this is valuable, is what happens after. So basically, uh, it gives us more flexibility to respond to the needs of our users. Um, because basically now when we need to provide changes, imagine that you need, you want a new partition for your slum queue. That will require on the current model that we have where everything is vertically integrated or baked into the image with complicated component artifacts, all of that interconnected. And uh, that takes a lot of work for us in order to do. That means less flexibility for you on the capabilities that you want. Um, they need require system administrator and it's very uh, time consuming. Now that we have this microservice architecture in order to provide the, the cluster for you, if there are changes, then we can independently deploy the, the changes to the cluster. Maybe we can update Slurm, and that will just require a change of my artifact of the configuration via my CI CD pipeline, and this might automatically do the change in the system. And I can do the same for any other service that you might have. 
Um, so configuration changes happen in this way. Version updates, I can do it in the same way. So I just released a new set of artifacts related to maybe my Slurm 23. And I can make that available. Maybe I could use um, uh, a canary deployment. So some people might have access to it on, on my system. Now, where these things get instantiated on the cluster, this is managed completely by the by the by the orchestrator itself, I don't need to manually hard code any parameter. This I'm completely decoupled as a system engineer from 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 the actual nodes that are there. Um, so what this actually means now is that my instantiation of these B clusters are dynamic. Um, I can define uh, I can define them by software. I could then use these environments to do CI/CD, staging, development, and production just by instantiating how the resources are being used, orchestrated by, by Nomad. Um, however, so I, I show you the picture, and we have some MVPs internal for how we are managing uh, uh, clusters at the centers, and I think this might be the, the, the future. The scope of the changes, this is something that we will see how we introduce these capabilities going forward. Um, but the work is not done, so there is still more work going on related to increase the microservice coverage, so bringing more of the traditional HPC services under this microservice model. Uh, implement more CIC pipelines, so even though we can do manually the, the creation of these services, we are also want them to be inside CIC pipelines, so that then um, they're properly uh, tested and validated, and this helps the speed for the creation of and changes of these services. On the automation side, we would like to be able to use uh, more fully the capabilities that we have, so that, for instance, that we could have automated or advanced self-healing. So right now it requires administrator intervention whenever nodes goes bad, but many times this actually means just maybe rebooting, re resetting some configurations, and if we do this via the orchestrator, we could do it automatically. We don't need a person to, to go through the process. We need a person to implement the automation. So you know, there's still work is not going away. It's just getting better, I guess. Um, to do node management, when, for instance, if we want to move resources within the different pools that we might have, this could happen dynamically with respect to usage. Uh, we want to enhance some of the API capabilities in order to provide higher level functions. So this is just to give more, to do more with the same amount of resources that we have at the center. Um, to improve on the, on the granularity of the IAM layer, right now it's rather, you need to be a system administrator in order to have access to us. Uh, I hope that we can we can put some constraints so that anyone, engineers, internal engineers could use it, not end users at the moment. Um, we also want to be an orchestrator. We have a lot of information. It'd be ideal if we could have automatic um, dashboards that could show you the full state of the system visually so that it's easy to track uh, and see what's happening on your system. So if nodes are going that bad, hopefully you don't need to go like uh, the matrix to see the characters floating around, but rather we can visually see what's going on. That's easier to, to move through that type of information. And um, the other thing that we're doing, I did not mention today, is that we're decoupling also the, the, all of the user environments so that it works under a container first for HPC, so the containers are completely transparent for the user and they're constantly running and using them. And with that, I want to thank you very much. I think I use all your time for... Pam 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 p